The title for this morning's message is Present Yourself to God. And the text comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. Let's read that text so it's fresh in our minds. So Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So our text today starts with that word, therefore. So what are we going to do in the introduction? We're going to see what it's there for, right? So what's it there for? Because Paul just finished the first part of Romans chapter 6, telling us of the believer's death and life with Christ. And you remember he started with a couple of questions in verse 1? He's like, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because he just got saying, done saying before that that sin does not correspond with the new life. So what's his answer? Certainly not, or God forbid, or by no means, or may it never be. But why is that the case? Why would he answer like that? He says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? If you've died to it, why are you going to live in it? He says we are dead to sin. And it's no longer to be our heart's desire. And he goes on to say, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We said that word baptized into Christ Jesus was the word used in the classics of a blacksmith who would who would dip a piece of hot iron into water, tempering it. So that picture there that we, the moment we believed, were immersed into Christ and tempered, changed. Our molecular structure of iron changes when it does. Guess what? We were changed. We became a new creation. Death was dead to us, right? We now became alive. That picture that we died with Christ in order that we may have life through Him and then live like Him. We saw the believer's holy life then is a consequence of their death to sin in Christ. And we're told we are to walk then in the in the newness of life. Remember that Greek word for newness refers to a newness of quality or character. What was the old life characterized by? Sin. What is the new life then to be characterized by? Righteousness. So a new life is to bring about new living. See, we've been united together In the likeness of Christ's death, Paul says, so certainly we also shall be united in the likeness of His resurrection. See, that word used for united is also translated as planted in other places. And that Greek word means something that's planted together so that thus they can grow together. As one. Remember we said that same Greek word was used speaking of conjoined twins. Right? Uniquely separate but yet together. Think about us as Christ. Growing with Him of joint origin. Planted with Him. See, this is the reality of our death with Christ. And Paul went on to talk about the reason of our death with Christ. 
Paul said, knowing this, in verse 6, knowing this, remember he was making an appeal to, to what should already be common knowledge to believers. You guys should know this, that our old man was crucified with him and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That idea of being crucified with Christ Paul, I think, explains it best in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. When he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we've been crucified with Christ. In verse 7, what Paul says, for he who has died has been freed from sin. See, it's the reason of our death with Christ is so that we no longer serve sin, but then we are given and we are with then the ability to serve God. No longer to serve sin, but now given the ability to serve God. And what was the result then of our death with Christ? He says, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. See that picture? He died once for all. One death for all sin, for all men, for all time. So what's our response to continuing in sin? It should be that we should now consider our new life in Christ. When you think, should I continue in that manner? Paul's saying, you better stop and think. Because you are a new person. One commentator said, apply Christ's position to your condition. I like that. Apply Christ's position to your condition. See, in verse 11 is the transition to our text today, which says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word likewise, right? In the same manner, in the same way as, as verses 8 through 10. In that same manner, he says reckon. That word reckon is an accounting term. And it means to, to mark down or to figure or account it to be so. Be another way to render that. So what are you to account to be so? Well, your account it to be that you yourself are to be dead unto sin. But then note the contrast, he says. You reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, account it to yourself to be dead to sin, but account it to yourself to be alive to God. And it's alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, that's the therefore now. As we hit verse 12. Since you are dead to sin and alive to God, Paul's saying this is what you should now do. Present yourself to God. So as we go through the text today, the outline is threefold. And it's three words. Purpose, Present and prevail. Purpose, present, prevail. So let's look at purpose in verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. See, what Paul is talking about here is, is an act of the will. Is an act of the will. 
Another way to think about this is purpose in your heart. Purpose in your heart to do this that you should not let sin reign in your mortal body. See, Paul just got done telling us positionally death to sin is true. But now, what is your response to that truth? Each one of us must answer, what is our response to that truth? How are we to live in our condition? Think about that. How are we to live? So in response to the fact that we are dead to sin through our association with Christ's death, Paul says we are not to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. In other ways, wise, we're not to let it reign in ourselves. So sin, he says, is not to reign in the flesh. That word reign means to rule or to govern or prevail. So it's not to rule, govern, or prevail us. See, when you come to saving faith in Christ, sin has been ejected from the throne. Think about that. Sin was sitting on the throne. And when you came to Christ, sin was thrown off the throne. It does not reign anymore. It does not have the right to reign in the Christian's life any longer. What's to reign in the Christian? It's grace through Christ's gift of righteousness. Right? Look what he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 21. It says, So that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, sin along with its strong desires, Paul is saying, must now be renounced. You must see sin in your life as off the throne, no longer controlling, no longer ruling. Another way of thinking about that, if it's not in charge, if it's not on the throne, it must not be obeyed. Because Paul says we died to it. It no longer has any rights to our lives. He says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. So he says we are not then to obey sin in its lust or in its desires. Right, that word obey literally to listen to or to hearken, if you will. See, Paul recognizes that there are within himself and within all men carnal desires. Right? Romans 7, 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Still carnal. There's still those carnal desires within man. See, in these lusts, these, as he says, these evil desires are what lead men into sin. But he's always saying they are to be rejected, they're to be stopped. Because they are desires to sin, and they have been crucified with Christ. And now he says, by becoming Christians, we need to deny their right to be in control over us. We have to deny that they're in control of us. We cannot allow it. If you could turn to Galatians chapter 5. See, it's by the work of the Holy Spirit that we're to overcome these sinful desires, these 
mortal passions, if you will. And it's by the Spirit's help that we overcome and we refuse them. We refuse them in any part of our life. See, as Christians, we're to walk and put ourselves under control of the Holy Spirit. See, this is an essential part of our spiritual battle here on earth. And from Romans, or from, sorry, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 onwards to the rest of the book of Galatians, it's all about the battle that we go through. But I want to read Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. What he's saying is walk in the Spirit. Make every purpose in your life. Make that decision to walk in the Spirit. Because when you're walking in the Spirit, you're walking to please God. And when you're pleasing God, you're forgetting about self. But he says the opposite's true, though. If you're walking to please self, you're totally forgetting about God. So what's the action? Right? What were the purpose in our heart, as he says in Galatians 5.16, to walk in the Spirit? See, it's active involvement. What is it here in Romans chapter 6, verse 12? Therefore, do not let, do not allow. It means put up an active barrier, an active thought. Stop. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. See, it has to be a deliberate purpose of the will. A decision has to be made. Not just one time. A decision constantly has to be made. What's going to reign? What's going to reign in my heart? Paul says sin must not reign in us. Let's look now what we're to present. Verse 13. He says, And do not Present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. See, what we have here is a matter of presenting, or if you have an old King James, yielding. He says, do not present, or the old King James, neither yield, See, the Greek word used is to be at the disposal of or to dedicate. And really what it is, it's a military term used in one giving up their weapon. So do not hand over the idea. Do not hand over your implement, your weapon. as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present, hand it over to God, but present or yield to God. And what's to be presented or what's to be given up or yielded? Paul says your members. And then he says later, present yourselves. If you could turn your Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. See, we have to control, is what he's saying. We have to control. We have to control our minds. We have to control our hearts. We've got to control our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our hands, our feet. And Jesus is going to say if they 
help us to sin, what are we to do? Metaphorically, cut them off. Look what he says in Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 47. He says, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into fire that shall never be quenched, where the worms do not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. For it's better to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye, he says, causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. See, Paul now is saying, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Jesus is saying, get rid of, get rid of that which causes or allows you to sin. Right? He's speaking metaphorically, if it's your hand, your eye, whatever. But today we can say, if it's something, whatever it is, that gives you the ability to sin or allows you to sin, the same is true. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. See, the idea here is you're going to yield. You're going to give your body over to one or the other. There's two sides here, right? Two views that he's given us. There's a positive and a negative. That negative, he's saying, you will, don't give it over to sin. right? Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. So the idea is you are not to do that. Why? Because you're not alive to it anymore. See, you're not as you used to be. Look down in verse 19. Paul says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and the lawlessness leading to more unlawlessness. Right? For just as you presented, you once presented, is the idea there. How did we once live? Yeah, we presented our bodies as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. He's saying don't do that anymore. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Paul had given a list of sins before that. And he says, such were some of you. Were. It's the old man. See, we're no longer to be servants to it. See, we were slaves to sin before. Were. Paul even uses that in verses 17 and 20 of Romans chapter 6. That we were, you were slaves to sin. No longer. So he says, do not present your body or as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But what's the positive view? He says, but present yourselves to God. Present yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Remember Ephesians chapter 2? You were dead in the trespasses of sin, but He has made you alive. See, surrender yourself, He's saying, to God. The idea there is that we are with Him. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 8. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. And then we have 
his example in verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. What's Paul saying here that we're to be? To give our whole lives, everything that we are, to God. Present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Why? Because we have a new purpose. Right? If anybody is in Christ Jesus, you're a new creation. The old things have passed away. And how many things have become new? All things. We have a new purpose in life. Paul's going to say in verse 22 of this chapter, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves to God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. So you've been set free from sin. (laughs) Why would you go back and let it reign in your life? Why would you hand over your body to it. See, the same body, he's saying, can be used right as an instrument or an implement or a tool or a weapon. It's kind of the what that word in the Greek is translated as. But notice it can be either used negatively or positively. The same body. Who makes the choice then? You do. See, the presentation of our bodies to Him as instruments, right? No longer of unrighteousness, but of righteousness. See, this is an encouragement here to present each part of ourselves to God part by part. When he says members, right? The whole, part by part. How about your soul? Your heart? Your mind? Your eyes? Right? Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. How about your ears? Your mouth? Your hands? Your feet? It's part by part we look at our lives and say, am I giving all to God? See, this is the concept that is going to be repeated by Paul later in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, which was the theme for our men's retreat this past year. I beseech you, he says, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Remember, some translations have, which is your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what are we to present? We're to present ourselves to God as being alive from the dead and we're to present our members as instruments of righteousness to God. And this presentation is an active, purposeful response to the truth that we are in Christ Jesus and that Christ Jesus is our Lord. Finally, let's look at prevail in verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. That word dominion means to to lord over, to exercise sway over. It comes from the main root Greek word which talks about a lord or a master or a sovereign that's in charge. 
So he says that sin is not to be in the position to reign over us, that shall not, for sin shall not have dominion over you. So sin should not have dominion over us. See, Paul has just told us that we should not think that we are alive to sin. Right? Verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? We're not to think that we're alive to sin anymore. We're not to let it reign in our flesh, he just told us in verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. He just told us also not to give any obedience to it, verse 12, that you should obey it in its lust. And then he told us that we should not yield our members to its leading. right? And do not present your, your members as instruments of, unri- of unrighteousness to sin. See, sin shall not have dominion over you. It shall not be in power in your life. It should not be ruling and reigning in you. And it should have no results in your life. Because if sin is reigning, and sin is what you're doing, sin will lead then to other sin, which then leads to other sin, which then leads you onward and downward. Why does Paul say that sin should not have dominion over us? He says, for you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, I want to say that this might be one of the most misinterpreted parts of the Bible, where some will take that and say, well, just get rid of the whole Old Testament then. That's not what that means. You have to think of it, if something has dominion over you, that means that you are in a domain. Does that make sense? A kingdom, a domain. Where a leader or something in that domain will then have dominion over you. See, we are part of a domain. And I love how Paul puts it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. When he says, He, God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. What was the domain we were in? Sin and darkness. And he said He transferred us, so He picked us up and He placed us in a new kingdom. If you're in a new kingdom, you have a new Lord who now has dominion over you. So sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because you're no longer in that domain. Because God has taken you out and put you into the kingdom of His beloved Son. See, we're no longer in the domain of darkness, of law, so that we're under its authority. We are in the kingdom of Jesus and now under His authority. That word under, right, just means under the authority of. See, we used to be, think about this, dominated by sin. And we were under the law's authority. See, the entire purpose, Paul is going to say, of the law is to prove sin to be sinful. Right? And that man, in and of himself, is sinful. So the entire purpose of the law, right, is to prove that sin is sinful. Now it looks that we were sinful, we are guilty, and we're legally doomed. That's what the law and being in the domain of sin showed us. See, to be under the law positionally then states our standing is to be in sin. We are in sin. 
right? And without question, if we're in that domain, we're guilty in our sin. And sin then manifests that we are then to be dead to those trespasses. See, the law demands payment, which is death. And there's nothing in the law to help us avoid that punishment. Paul says, but you are not under law. See, the law does still exist. It's right here. It still does exist. It still is the standard. And it's the standard for the believer to know how we should live for God. It's still there. It's still a standard. But now we are ruled by another. That's the idea here. We're ruled by another. And what is it that dominates the believer? That has dominion over them? He says you are under grace. See, that's the good news. We are sinful, yet redeemed. Our guilt was removed by a substitute. And we're going to come and celebrate our substitute's death on that cross in a little bit. See, the good news is we are no longer under law because we are legally free in Christ. Amen. I don't know how much easier and how much better it gets, but you're legally free in Christ. See, to be under grace then is to be transferred from the law to a new position in Christ. It's all by grace. See, to be under grace and not under law removes our guilt, our punishment, so that we can now be alive unto God. See, the demands of the law were met in Christ and then credited to our account by grace. So that's why, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and to present your members, your whole bodies as instruments of righteousness to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for these words and I pray that we would that we would think about everything that we do, Lord. Every thought would be held captive. And that we would present ourselves as instruments of righteousness. That we would remember that You paid the price on that cross for our sin so that we could die to sin and live to God. So Father, thank You for loving us enough to send Your Son. And it's in His precious name that we pray. Amen.